1785, the English jurist and philosopher Jeremy Bentham introduced a prison reform initiative. One of the most compassionate and utilitarian thinkers of the Enlightenment, Bentham's correctional facility was not designed to impose punishment, but to generate discipline. Unlike the linear sequence of dark dungeons that prevailed for many centuries during and after the Middle Ages, Bentham's structure was circular, spacious and bright. The design featured a central tower surrounded by a ring of cells. Each cell featured a large rear window, enabling a clear view of every prisoner. Venetian blinds in the central tower allowed a single guard to oversee all of the inmates without them knowing if they were being watched. Bentham coined the term panopticon to describe this structure. The first panoptical prisons were built after Bentham's death. And just as he predicted, the notion of an invisible, ever-present authority generated a heightened state of discipline among the prisoners. In 1975, the French philosopher Michel Foucault declared that more than a building, the panopticon represented a mind control mechanism a method of social self-regulation through the power of surveillance. In that respect, the perfect panoptical device is the omnipresent God of monotheistic religion, an invisible entity that judges not only your visible behavior, but your every thought and dream, every second, everywhere. The self-regulation mechanism that this device generates is so powerful and absolute that many dare not even question it in their own minds. The unyielding loyalty that clergymen receive from their followers has much to do with their claim of representing this otherworldly entity. Images have been widely used by religious institutions as constant reminders of God's unwavering authority and of the terrible consequences of challenging it. From religious propaganda, the state learned how to exploit guilt and how to establish a deep personal connection with each audience member. By then, Serious efforts were underway to formulate a scientific theory of mass manipulation. At the turn of the 20th century, the work of two men would transform our understanding of the mind. By interpreting dreams, the Austrian doctor Sigmund Freud concluded that aspects of our behavior originated from repressed sexual and aggressive forces. Meanwhile, in Russia, the physiologist Ivan Pavlov induced dogs to salivate at the ring of a bell by associating its sound with food. Freud would develop the principles of psychoanalysis and Pavlov the principles of classical conditioning. While these theories originated in Europe, their systematic application to mass control and social engineering would be pioneered in America. Based in New York, Freud's nephew Edward Bernays would use his famed uncle's theories to become one of the most influential men of the 20th century. He coined the term public relations and then became its master. Using the principles of psychoanalysis to exploit collective fears and desires, he created groundbreaking campaigns for private, corporate, and political clients. Capitalizing on the women's liberation movement of the 1920s, Bernays delivered a whole new demographic to the tobacco industry by positioning cigarettes as symbols of female empowerment. Exploiting fears of communism during the Cold War, Bernays organized a campaign to overthrow the democratically elected president of Guatemala. He linked President Jacobo Arbenz Guzman to Russia by spreading false and inflammatory accusations. This led to the covert CIA operation that deposed Arbenz in 1954. A fact not publicly disclosed at the time was that the campaign had been financed by the United Fruit Company. The food producer known today as Chiquita was facing serious financial threats from the new Guatemalan president. According to Bernays himself, it was United Fruit's unlawful political control in Central America that originated the term Banana Republic. The Guatemalan coup was the critical event that would transform the young Argentinian doctor, Ernesto Guevara, into a militant rebel leader. And while El Che was executed in 1967 by the CIA, his portrait survived as one of the most iconic images in history. Bernays' network of celebrities, paid experts, manufactured associations, media outlets, industry lobbyists, and political allies allowed him to exert immense influence over public perception, 
establishing the dynamics for today's PR industry. It would lead to the emergence of global PR outfits such as Hill and Knowlton. With 90 offices in 52 countries, this firm was hired by the tobacco industry to refute the link between smoking and lung cancer, has been involved in promoting war in the Middle East by manufacturing false testimonies, and is often hired by tyrants to help them improve their reputation following human rights violations. It has also represented drug money launderers, Big Pharma, and the Church of Scientology, and was recently campaigning in favor of the fracking industry. Based on Pavlov's work, the American psychologist John Watson established the principles of behaviorism. He asserted that any neutral stimulus could be used to evoke a strong reaction when associated with the primal compulsions of hunger, fear, rage, love, vanity, and sexuality. As head of psychology at Johns Hopkins University, Watson conducted a highly controversial experiment. He conditioned an 11-month-old baby to fear animals by producing a terrifying noise every time the child was in contact with a furry creature. Adding to the controversy, it was discovered that Watson was having an affair with his student and assistant, Rosalie Reiner. Watson was forced to resign from his faculty position, but he immediately embarked on a new career that would make him a very wealthy man. Stanley Rezer, president of J. Walter Thompson, was convinced that Watson's principles could be effectively applied to advertising, and in 1920, hired the famed psychologist. By 1924, Watson was named vice president, and the company became the largest and most successful advertising firm of the 20th century. As other agencies followed in their steps, the primary goal of advertising shifted from spreading awareness about products to inciting emotional attachments to them. This practice turned consumerism into a form of self-expression, one where the product's usefulness is often secondary to the statement it makes about its users. Marketing products as aspirational symbols required an understanding of the consumer's desires, fears, hopes, and dreams. To that effect, in 1946, Austrian-American psychologist Ernest Dichter founded the Institute for Motivational Research. Dichter coined the term focus group to describe his market research practice and paved the way for others to follow. In 1978, social scientist Arnold Mitchell and his colleagues at the Stanford Research Institute developed VALS, the Values, Attitudes, and Lifestyles System. Based on the work of Harvard sociologist David Reisman and psychologist Abraham Maslow, this proprietary market research methodology is still in use today, and it concentrates on categorizing consumers in order to help marketers reinforce, sustain, or modify their spending habits. The research showed that age, education, and socioeconomic status played a defining role on a subject's reaction to propaganda. It also showed that brand loyalty was deeper and longer lasting as age decreased. Children, with their strong emotional responses and underdeveloped cognitive defenses, became the market's preferred targets. If an adult stalks a child and takes advantage of a power imbalance to exploit his vulnerability without any concern for his well-being, we all recognize it as abuse. But when thousands of adults, psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists, MBAs, designers, advertisers, programmers, follow, film, question, study, analyze, and target millions of children and take advantage of a power imbalance to exploit their vulnerability without any concern for their well-being. We simply call it marketing. While today's parents are expected to moderate their children's exposure to media, 120 years of dedicated behavioral research and infinite marketing dollars make this a disproportionate battle especially when these parents also grew up as targets of the psychological conditioning they are supposed to prevent. Furthermore, the character of the ideal parental relationship is constantly being redefined and molded by the media itself. A media where domestic bliss is found in the joys of consumption and where generational differences disappear behind ageless excitement for products. Children act beyond their age while adults are portrayed as irresponsible, rebellious, and immature. This marketing technique is aimed at making both children and adults 
feel inadequate with their actual age in order to get them to consume. Capitalizing on our innate desire for acceptance, commercial propaganda has become a ubiquitous and powerful panopticon, one where a sense of surveillance generated by social judgments and expectations prompts a variety of conditioned responses. Unlike Bentham's physical prison, in this invisible structure, the boundaries between the observer and the observed are always blurry and shifting. Within this construct, we are all simultaneously the collective guard as well as the individual prisoners. If these mechanisms come across as too obvious, it's because they are, and yet they work. Propaganda may not always be successful at telling us what to think, but it's often very successful at telling us what to think about. A common belief is that psychological persuasion only works on others less intelligent and sophisticated than ourselves. Ironically, those who perceive themselves as more intelligent and sophisticated usually spend the most on the illusions constructed by propaganda. Few will admit their vulnerability to mind control. Most of us prefer to rationalize our choices as totally free, autonomous and independent. But as Goebbels explained, it is exactly this arrogant self-assurance that enables the implementation of control systems. The more arrogant a society, the more vulnerable it is to manipulation. This is a disturbing phenomenon, especially since narcissism and arrogance are two of the main byproducts of today's media environment.